Um, my name is Oliver Davis, uh, and this session is deploying PHP applications using Ansible and Ansible Vault and Ansistrano. Uh, we're going to cover a few different things today. Uh, first of all, my name is Oliver, as I said. Um, I'm a developer, software engineer at a company in the UK called Invica. Uh, however, this talk is mostly based on my personal experience working with these tools on sort of personal projects and site projects. Um, I do quite a lot in the Drupal space. I'm an Acquia certified uh, Drupal 8 developer uh, and I maintain various modules on Drupal.org uh, as well as maintaining actually quite a, f a few uh, roles for Ansible, some of which we'll touch on during this talk. Uh, firstly, it's probably good to notice when maybe this approach is not suitable for you. So uh, we, at least in Invika, and I guess many others, use platform as a service hosting solutions such as the ones on the screen, like Platform SH and Acquia, who have tools such as uh, Platform has build tools and deploy steps built into it, as does Acquia for pipelines. So a lot of what we're going to talk about, you can probably rep you can replicate using uh, their native offerings. I tend to use, at least for personal projects, services like DigitalOcean or Linode or Volta or Rackspace. Service is more where they give you a server and it's up to you then to configure the server and handle all the application deployment yourself. So, all this may be a case of uh, in a client situation they don't have a budget uh, for a fully managed sys um, system like an Acquia or a platform, or maybe they're using an internal infrastructure like their own service in a rack in the basement or something, which I've seen. So, we're going to be looking at three parts of the Titan implies. Firstly, we're going to be looking at uh, a little bit of an Ansible crash course for people who may not have used it before. How we can then use Ansible Vault to keep secrets and to keep our um, credentials safe. And then how we can use a tool uh, called Ancestrano to use deployments, uh, as well as how to do deployments with Ansible natively. So firstly, what is Ansible? Uh, the definition from their website is it's an open source tool that automates software provisioning, which I think is what it's mostly used for people using it to set up their servers, uh, but it can also be used for deploying their applications onto the servers as well. Um, so it's a command line tool, uh, it gives you at least three or four different uh, commands you can run in your terminal. Uh, it's written in Python, um, but you don't need to use or write Python in order to be able to use it. Uh, so it's mostly configured with YAML, which you know, as Drupal 8 developers, I assume most of us are using Drupal 8 or have used YAML in uh, some other services so like Jekyll or, or something. Um, most people uh, can figure are familiar with uh, YAML, uh, or at least uh, Ginger 2 templates, which are very, very similar to Twig. Um, and it's used then to run, you run commands locally on your machine or on a dedicated uh, run machine, and you run those on a remote server, which could be your DigitalOcean or your Linode or a Vagrant Box locally if you're doing local development. And it's used to install software packages, so if you're running a web server, you're going to install your Apache, your MySQL, uh, your Redis, etc. using it. Uh, and as I said, you can also use it to deploy, uh, to run deployment steps such as your Git clone, and etc. Et and Ansible, one, reason, one of the reasons why I like Ansible is it has a batteries included approach, which means in comparison to other tools, including some that I've used, uh, they don't have... Um, tools like there's a Composer module within Ansible that we can use to run Composer. So it comes very much with these things built in. Um, that's you know, just one example. MySQL is another module I use quite a lot for managing databases. So all of these things are included as part of the uh, core package. Some of the key concepts, uh, hosts and inventories, are sort of mean the same thing. That's how you tell Ansible where your servers are. There are commands that we can run from the command line using uh, Ansible commands. We can then write playbooks, which we'll look at some examples of, which are written in YAML. Tasks are individual steps that we run that are combined inside a playbook. And then roles are a collection of tasks that we can package up and deploy. So reasons why I like Ansible is it's a familiar syntax. As I say, it uses YAML a lot. Drupal 8 uses YAML. Uh, and again, Ginger 2 is very, very similar to Twig, so we're getting used to the thing of that. Um, it's easily readable, so any developer on a team could open up a playbook and figure out what it does. 
which you really can't say that for certain other tools. There are no server dependencies, um, except for Python, that I'm aware of, um, actually on the remote server. So I've also used tools such as Puppet, which relies on you to install uh, software packages on the remote server, which this isn't the case in, in this instance. So as long as you know pretty much what the IP address of the server is and you can connect to it over SSH, you can run Ansible commands against it. And therefore it's easy to add to an existing, existing project. And as I said in the last slide, it comes with relevant modules for PHP development, such as Composer and MySQL, etc. So let's look at an example of a host file, an inventory. Uh, there are a couple of ways, two ways that I have to define these. Um, the first is uh, an INI syntax, INI syntax, where we group our web, uh, in this case, web servers together uh, inside the double curly, uh, double square bracket, and then we list our, our IP addresses. So this is for a vagrant box uh, in a group that I'm calling web servers. So this is going to be my web servers. Uh, alternatively, you can use YAML again for this. So this does the same thing, but in a slightly different format. And these are really simple examples, but you can do ranges, you, uh, so you can have uh, between IP addresses between one and three or one and five, or um, if you're using certain host names with uh, sequential numbers, you can sort of wildcard them in there. So uh, there is also ways of pulling in the building inventory using a manifest file externally as well, but I can't really, I don't have time to speak to that right now. Uh, commands, so this is the most basic simple command that we can run. Uh, we're going to use Ansible, we're going to tell it which group of hosts to run against. So we can just say all in this case. Uh, this could be web servers based on our previous slide. And then we can use dash m to tell it which Ansible module to run. So ping is one that's just going to send a request to the server and look for a response back. So this is what this looks like. We see our server group at the top. This is successful. We do get some facts back. So these are things that Ansible has figured out about our system or retrieved from our system. Nothing has changed, so Ansible has not made any you know, updates to our system, um, but we sort of send a ping, we've got a pong back, right? So I guess most of us are familiar with that concept, but we know that Ansible in this case is to be able to connect to our server and uh, at least you know, be able to make a connection. This is another example, you know, using a slightly different command. So in this case, we're actually using the command module that we can use to run arbitrary commands against the server. So again, we can say Ansible all, uh, use dash m to specify which module. The module is called command, which is slightly confusing maybe. And we can use dash a to pass through arguments. So in this case, we're just going to run git pull. And we can say uh, to change into this directory before we run that command using dash s chdir. So in this case, go to slash app, then run git pull. A more realistic example is to use the actual git module that ships with the Ansible. So we can do that with dash m uh, git, so use the git module, and then pass through our uh, values or arguments to pass through to the module. So this is our repository. Uh, this is a, a, a setup that I was playing with for Ansible and Drupal, so Ansible, Drupal, Ansible. And these key value things, so repo equals and dest equals, these are arguments provided by the module. So you can look upon the de documentation, what these are, some of them have defaults, some of them you have to specify values for. So in this case, this is the repository URL, this is the destination, i.e. the path we're going to clone that repository into on the server. Tasks and playbooks, uh, so these are sort of YAML grouping of commands. Okay? So we can specify again our host file, uh, we can specify some variables under a, a vars key. So we're going to store our git repository string as, as a variable in this case. And then our task, we've moved that command into a task. So we're still using the git module. We're still telling it which repository to use, uh, which destination to go, etc. Uh, we're specifying the master version in this case, the, uh, the branch or the tag or the commit shard to, to, to check out. And in this case, we can say update true. But you'll notice the git repo now is using the double curly brace syntax because it's a variable. We're going to substitute the value the, that with our var section above. There's a different command to run for running a playbook, so Ansible colon playbook. We specify the path to the playbook, so I tend to put them in Ansible directory, um, and root my project. 
and then I use dash i to specify the inventory, so the host file that we're going to use. So in this case, it's just called host.yaml. And then I think lastly for the for this section, roles. Roles are collections of playbooks. So uh, Jeff Girling, who I guess most people in the Drupal community are familiar with, um, writes a lot of Ansible modules, um, including like, these are ones that I use to set the basic sort of LAMP stack, or yes, LAMP stack in this case. Uh, this is going to install Apache Composer, uh, MySQL, PHP, and, and the PHP MySQL stack. So um, the ordering does matter, <laughs> I found before. I tend to default to ordering these alphabetically, but that doesn't work. Um, but this is how you take, use these uh, five roles to make a fully functional LAMP server with Apache MySQL Composer on your server. Uh, the best way to do this is to st have a requirements file. So very similar to your composer JSON file, you have a requirements YAML file uh, specifying um, which so which um, roles you're going to install. Uh, you can specify version numbers. I recommend you do so. Uh, we would then tell Ansible Galaxy where to pull these roles from and, and to install them. And then once you've got them downloaded, we can just plug them into our playbook. Uh, we can specify roles and then specify the list of roles. And actually here, it's, it's where the role, uh, the order matters rather than the other place. So, uh, again, we can see that how we can use these to do some provisioning tasks, like creating a database, because Drupal, we need a database. So we can use uh, MySQL underscore DB module to create a database for us. We can give it a name, so my database. Uh, the state is present, so we need the database to be present and, and to exist. Uh, and then we're going to create a user using MySQL user. And our name uh, is going to be Drupal, and our password is secret. And we can specify which databases on we want this user to apply to. So now we've got that, we can use Ansible to do a basic deployment. So with another playbook, this one's going to be called Deploy YAML. Uh, we can create our directory. So we're going to create this in slash app. We can say it's going to be a directory rather than being a file or a symlink. We can upload our application, so Ansible has a synchronized module, which is basically an app or a wrapper around rsync to upload our files from our local uh, machine. And we can use the Composer module to just do a, a Composer install inside that directory. So this is a really, really basic deployment script that we could use. There are some disadvantages, so single point of failure. If our Composer install was to fail or, or something, then our site would be down. Uh, we'd have no ability to roll back at that point. We'd have to, you know, our site would be down. We'd have to go figure out what's going on, do another, you know, re-upload, etc. Uh, and our sensitive data is stored in plain text for everybody to see. Uh, you know, particularly if this is a, an open source repository and if it's a public repository, uh, you don't want your MySQL passwords and databases and, and everything to be stored in plain text. Uh, this is where Ansible Vault comes in. So again, this is packaged with Ansible um, out of the box. So we can use uh, ansible-vault uh, create to create a vault file. I'm going to store it in my Ansible directory and call it vault.yml. This is what it looks like. So it's going to open up uh, Vim or Sublime Text or whatever your default editor is. Uh, you can type in your, your things. That's fine. So I'm just moving those values into uh, this vault file. So again, it's just key value pairs written in YAML. Uh, but if you were just to open that file in plain text, this is what you would see. So this is no good to anybody, right? We can quite certainly put this on a GitHub repository or something if you wanted to. What I then tend to do is have sort of a middle variables file. So I tend to prefix all of my vault variables with vault. Uh, so you can see the vault underscore something. So that makes it quite clear to me that they're coming from the vault rather than from a, a separate variables file. But maybe for the sake of keeping my playbooks clean, I don't necessarily need to see the word vault everywhere. So I tend to have this um, vault to sort of normal variable in, in most places. So. And the great thing then is I can just substitute out my private sensitive data with what's going from the vault in the same way I did for the Git repository uh, URL earlier. And then to edit the vault, it's basically the same command. You just run edit rather than create. Uh, it opens up the same window. You make your changes, save it, and it updates your vault for you. 
Uh, now we've, oh yeah, so how do we then access the vault? So the, I should have mentioned the vault was password protected. So you enter a password to access your vault. So you store that in LastPass or something ideally. Um, the la Ansible then will ask you to specify how do you get into the vault. And you can do this using uh, Ask Vault Pass option. So it will prompt you for it uh, on the command line. Uh, if you're doing it in the CI CD pipeline, you can store it as in a file and specify the path to the file as an environment variable. So we've seen a really basic deployment. Uh, how do you do better deployments? Um, this is where Ancestrano comes in. So Ancestrano is just another role, or technically two more roles. Uh, and if the name seems familiar to people, if you've used a tool called Capistrano, it's um, a port of that from, um, I want to say Ruby, I think, into um, Ansible, which is great. So there are some, yeah, obviously there are some features. Um, multiple release directories, so by default it's going to have each release in a separate directory. Uh, there's the option to have shared paths and files, so for Drupal we have files directory where our user uploaded files go to need to be shared, so we can do that. Uh, and it's really, really flexible and customizable which we'll look at in a minute. Uh, we can use multiple deployment strategies. So we saw rsync in the previous example. We can also pull from a Git repository or an SVN repository or something. Uh, and we can use multi-stage environments. So if you've got um, sort of a production site and then a staging site, um, it can cater for that use case as well. Uh, and there is an option to prune the old releases. So you can say keep the last three releases or five releases or ten releases um, depending on your project and your situation, and it will stop that directory getting you know, really, really crazy big and filling up all your disk space. And this, the second role, so one role is to deploy, one role is, one role is to roll back. So there's a, you have a separate playback to do a rollback to the previous release if, uh, if you discover a problem and you need to roll back. So how do we do it? In our requirements file, we're going to require Ansible, sorry, ancestrano.deploy and ancestrano.rollback. And in our playbook, all we need to do under roles is specify the roles that we want to use, so our deploy role in this case. As I mentioned, it's customizable, so our deploy uh, it provides a number of variables that we can use to configure it. So our deploy directory, uh, I tend to have sort of project specific variables, release specific variables, um, and they're all underscored with their sort of level or the scope. Um, but then Ancestrano provides its own one, so Ancestrano underscore something. So in this case, we're going to deploy via Git, so we're going to clone from a Git repository. We're going to deploy to um, our var www directory in this case. Uh, we're going to clone from the master branch and again our Git repository. So we can use essentially the same command in this case to uh, run deploy with Ancestrano. Uh, this is what it looks like on the server. So if I'm inside my uh, app directory in this case, I can output the uh, directories. We can see our releases directory, which is where all of our releases live. Uh, our shared directory is where our shared stuff lives. And there's a symbol there called current. So current is a pointer to the active release. So we'll see it goes into the releases directory and uses a timestamp value for, for each release. So they're all unique. And each release yeah, is on a separate directory, completely isolated from each other. And then if one fails, it just doesn't update the symlink. So it would sit there as a fail build. As I mentioned, you have the option to roll back. So we can do this using the rollback playbook. So I have a, uh, sorry, the rollback role, which I store in a playbook called rollback. And then all I need to do in this case is include the rollback role. And then again, give it where we're going to deploy to. And it will know which one to roll back to. Uh, from there if something was to fail. And again, we just run. The only thing we're going to change is the path to the playbook in this case, so rollback.yaml rather than uh, deploy. So a few more minutes left. Um, customization, there are a number of build hooks that you can hook into during a, an access trial deploy. Um, there's always a before and after. So in this case, um, shared is where your file directories and your log directories and your cache directories are. Um, linked, uh, there's a before and after symlink, so when that current symlink gets updated, um, sorry, there's a, sorry, two symlink steps, one is when the actual shared symlink is linked, 
One is when the uh, current release is linked, and then there's a cleanup step. So uh, if you want to sort of remove your node modules directory or database exports or testing databases, um, you could do that in that step there. Apologies, something is quite small, but we can see again, um, we can tell it where our um, symlink tasks are. So if we want to customize these, we can add extra YAML files based on uh, which step we want to hook into. So I normally have uh, sort of a matching playbook per step. These live in my um, direct in the Ansible directory, and in those I make the appropriate changes that we need. So uh, in this case, um, Anstrano gives us some additional variables again. So which is our current active release? We can't hard code that because we don't know. So we can use uh, Anstrano release path. Um, dot std out, and that will give us the uh, active release to zoom into. And then we can use that as part of our commands as well. So you go in, and this is in the after update code. So once Git has pulled down our new um, code, our new composer JSON log file, we can then run uh, composer to install those dependencies locally using again that variable. I normally store a uh, Drush path, so Drush is a dependency of our project in this case, so again, I'm going to store a, a release Drush path, and that's going to change based on the release, because it's, it's going to change. Um, and in this case, we're going to run um, Drush just to run our database updates um, after the symlink shared, the shared symlink has been updated. And in this case, once everything's happened, we've linked the final symlink, so now the current one, we've new, released a new version. After that's happened, we're going to clear our Drupal cache again so that you know, our new version is, is nice and cache free. And then once we've done that, we get our website that we can, we can use. So I have a, a quick demo, which we can maybe see that's running. So let me find my cursor. There we go. So in this case, there's nothing, there's no website. So we get a nice Apache not found error. Let me walk in here so I can see what we're doing. No, there we go. So in this case, we're going to run our. I can't see this one here, sorry. Yeah, so this is running the deploy script. So you can see Anstrano and Ansible are going to give us this output of every step. It's going to show us what's changed because it's in yellow typically and it will say changed somewhere. This angle is really weird for me seeing the screen, I apologize. Um, you can see exactly which steps it's running. We can see some of these steps are added by Ancestrano.deploy right on the left hand side. We can see again certain ste steps it's going to skip. So rsync is going to skip because we're not using rsync. Uh, right now it's update. Um, we are using rsync. Um, so it's going to update. It's deploying existing code to our server. The, uh, it's now renaming settings.php. This is a custom step that I've added just to re sim link that or to copy the default one into the right place. It's going to install composer dependencies. Then it's going to do its cleanup steps. So once it's finished doing the sharing, so everything's clean. Uh, another step there is to fix our file permissions. Finally, it's going to install Drupal. And once again, it's done that. It's now going to do our soft link to our new release to make it active. Then it's going to prune our previous release directory. So we only have a certain number. We see the sort of summary at the end. And now if we reload the page, we got our website. And if we just to sort of prove it's working, we can actually go ahead and just log in and actually see, see Drupal there. So Apologies, that's a bit odd to narrate because I'm at a funny end <laughs> of the screen, so I apologize. Um, that video is actually up on YouTube, on my YouTube channel, so if you want to see a better or recap, that's on YouTube afterwards. So, um, do we have time for questions? One question. One question, one or two. Yes, okay. Um, uh, the YAML files or the definitions of the build or release are all uh, stored in the repos, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so yeah, the question was, are all the. Could you the question in the microphone? Of course. Yeah, so the question was, are all the build scripts and playbooks stored in the repository? Yes, uh, yes. yeah, usually I do. Um, I've got projects on GitHub that have this set up. Um, and yeah, I don't 
The advantage then being that any developer on a project can clone the repository and then see what the, the um, deployment scripts are doing. Uh, it's not in a separate sort of hidden repository somewhere else. Um, because of the, the readability of them, I think they do serve as some documentation as well, uh, which is obviously a good thing. And I don't need to worry about um, people seeing my database credentials because they're stored in the vault and they just see sort of the, the hashed output of it rather than the actual credentials. Uh, let's say that you're in control of uh, building and releasing multiple projects. Mm -hmm. um, are there any implementations where you have the definitions stored in a separate repo that is dedicated for this uh, while it's uh, building and releasing for other repos and other projects? Or the question is, are there, are there shared things I could pull into my project repository that combine some of these steps together? Is that what you're asking? Uh, let's say that there are multiple projects stored in multiple repositories, mm -hmm. but you would like to have the same um, build and release pipelines uh, for them. Yeah. So you would have this, uh, probably a separate repo mm -hmm. that holds all these definitions separately. Is there an implementation or is there possible to have uh, such an implementation? It's probably a way to do it in, maybe you could split them out into a separate repository and then include them in a certain way. Um, I've done that, I think, with YAML and Ansible before. That would be one way to do it. Um, usually I just keep them in per project because they're all slightly different anyway. Um, at least that's been my experience so far. Okay. One more? <laughs> okay. Can you clarify a bit the, the, the state of after symbling and the after symbling links? Because you, uh, because I wonder, like uh, your presentation, you have trust clear as after symbling, right? Mm -hmm. And then I wonder, like, what happened if you do it after symbling share? Like, I don't, I don't quite understand the, the state after symbling link and then after symbling. What happened with the the code inside the? <coughs> So what's the difference between Symlink Shared and Symlink? Um, so Symlink Shared, it depends how you've got it set up. So Symlink Shared is probably going to contain your files directory. So um, you know any user uploaded content and possibly your settings or PHP file because you want that to be, again, consistent across each deploy. Um, in that case, you could put it, those tasks in Symlink or Symlink Shared. Um, because once it's a symbol, that's that's fine. Um, if you're doing something like a cache clear, you probably want to do it after the main site is live. Um, there are probably certain ones like, I'm trying to think of a good example of something. Maybe if you're trying to run a migration on a pre-prod environment, you want to run that through Drush. So after the settings file is in place, but before the deployment is, is made live. So again, if that was to fail for some reason, or maybe you're running some tests locally that need your settings file in place. Um, that would probably be uh, a good example of that, I think. So if you Does that do help? like a config update, where do you put it? Yeah, config updates again. Um, I would put that after shared, because then if your config update was to, or your import was to fail, the site is not live at that point. The site is not live till it's got passed here. So if you can run it there, then if it was to fail, then it's not going to affect your live site yet. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, the answer to docs are really good as well, so I'd definitely suggest taking a look at those. Uh, let's see, there we go, contribution sprints tomorrow, so please come to the sprints. Uh, any feedback would be great on uh, this website or to me on Twitter, that would be brilliant. Um, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>